Well, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Uh, so friends, we are uh, in the Easter season where we're reflecting on this reality that Jesus has risen from the dead and, and all that that means for us. And so we're in a series right now called All Things New, where we're looking at how his resurrection makes all things new. Uh, real quick, uh, I'm Gabe, by the way, one of the pastors here, and uh, excited to, to get into this text with you. Also, uh, if, uh, if this sermon does anything at all for you, there's one person you can thank, uh, and that's my good friend Liz Fancett, who moments before I came up, recognized I had lint on the back of my shirt and took it off for me. I know, it's big. It's powerful. Yeah, yeah, we're good. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, um, all right, so let's, let's get into uh, to what we're going to get into today. So my, uh, my daughter Lila, uh, nine years old, she is part of a, a Christian dance company. Uh, now, if you hear about that, you're like, that oh, feels a bit parochial to me, Pastor Gabe. Well, I'm a pastor, okay, so uh, it is a little parochial, but it's okay. It's actually, it's awesome. Uh, I love it so much, uh, and here's why. Uh, so, so my daughter's uh, Christian dance company had a recital back in December, just a few weeks uh, before Christmas. And I'll tell you, I was, of course, excited uh, to see my daughter perform, to see her talents on display, to see all her hard work pay off. I was, of course, also simultaneously not excited to sit in a cold and dark auditorium for three hours and watch other people's kids perform, right? Uh, and so as we get to the recital, I'm kind of like in a grumpy mood, uh, but then as the recital is, is about to start, uh, the director of the dance company gets up front uh, to, to introduce herself and, and the company. And so she introduces herself, and after she introduces herself, she doesn't say anything else at all, and she just looks at everyone in the audience, parents, grandparents, cousins, little siblings. And without missing a beat, she says, one thing I know about every person in this room is you're all going to die. And I was like, okay, all right, I see you. I like this. I am in. I am in now, right? Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, I have an enormous poster over my desk here at ULC uh, with a huge skull on it, and underneath it it says Memento Mori, which is Latin for remember you shall die. So I'm like, this gal, we're vibing, we're vibing. Uh, and so then the director presses on, and she's like, so every person in here is a slave to death because you can't escape it. I was like, all right, this is super metal. Like, I'm ready, like, very Heideggerian, like, let's go. And then she goes on, she's like, but Christmas is about how Jesus, God in the flesh, came to set us free from slavery to death and reconcile us to God. And at that point, I'm like, yes, let's go. Like, preach it, sister, which is very awkward for everyone else in the auditorium. Um, I didn't really yell it. Okay, I'm Lutheran. Okay, so um, <laughs> we yell in our hearts, right? So, uh, she concluded and said, and our performance today is meant to illustrate all that God did and has done to bring about this reconciliation. And friends, then the show began and it was amazing. Like obviously I love my daughter's parts the best, but friends, I just sat there with just like tears in my eyes the whole time. Because there's just something beautiful about reconciliation, isn't there? Like reconciliation is beautiful when we see it just happen at a, a human level. Right, like no matter how you feel about, about the military, you can't tell me uh, that when one of those videos of a soldier coming home and, and surprising his family, like you can't tell me when that comes across your newsfeed, it doesn't just move something in your heart. It doesn't just bring a little tear to your eye when, when his kid just jumps in his arms and they freak out, right? It's amazing. It's so moving. Like we love when reconciliation happens, whether it's physical distance separating people or emotional wounds separating people. It's always incredible when that separation is overcome and people are reconciled together again. And so then I would say, how much more so in our text for today, we see that God in Christ reconciles the world to himself. And so as we're in the second week of this series of how we focus on Jesus' resurrection from the dead and how in that he's making all things new, today we're looking at how in his resurrection he makes us a new creation and liberates us from slavery to death and reconciles us to God. And in our text we see it's in being made a new creation and reconciled to God that we are given three things. We're given a direction in life. We're given a deeper understanding of ourselves, and we're given an eternal relationship with God. So that'll be our outline today. You're given a direction in life, 
given a new understanding of self, and given an eternal relationship with God. Uh, And so let's get into it. Look with me at our first couple of verses. It says this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Okay, we have so much context we have to get into, 945. All right, so hang with me for the next, like, well, most of the rest of the sermon. Here we go. Okay, so, so here's the context. So uh, the book of, of 2 Corinthians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the ancient city of Corinth. And he wrote it, we figure, about A.D. 55. Uh, 55 AD. Uh, and Corinth is, is a church that he started. You can actually read about it in Acts chapter 18, how he gets this church started. Uh, but pretty soon after he starts this church, uh, he takes off on another journey as his kind of Paul's modus operandi. But once he leaves Corinth, he gets a report that this church he started uh, is having all sorts of problems, all sorts of behavioral isho- issues, theological issues, just major problems going on. Uh, and so he writes a letter to them uh, to correct the errors that are occurring in this church. So we call that letter 1 Corinthians. We have that letter. But it turns out uh, that he sends a letter to the church in Corinth. They read it. They're like, okay, we get it. We'll, we'll change our ways. But then some false teachers show up uh, who are wealthy and successful and well-spoken. And they say, hey, that letter that Paul wrote, you should ignore it. In fact, you should ignore Paul in general. Like, look at him. He's poor. He's working class. He's not eloquently spoken. And have you ever noticed he's a bit eccentric? Like, Paul might be crazy. Y'all should just ignore him. And so a bunch of people in this church in Corinth start to reject Paul's authority as an apostle. And he hears about this, and he's like, all right, I got to do something about it. So he goes to see the church in Corinth in person. uh, And he calls this visit in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, quote, the painful visit. Uh, And so he goes and has this painful visit. But after the visit, it seems like things are actually pretty cool. The church in Corinth is is listening to him again. They respect his authority as an apostle. Things seem to be all right. But he writes this letter, 2 Corinthians, to sort of tie up any loose ends. And so the first seven chapters of 2 Corinthians are more or less Paul seeking to reconcile his relationship with the Corinthian church. And then we get to the verse immediately preceding our text for today. And uh, Paul says that one day we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the verse right before our verse for today. And then, uh, if you don't mind clicking back to verse 11 for me. uh, He says this, in light of us standing before the judgment seat of Christ, says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So he says, in light of us standing in front of the judgment seat of Christ, We know the fear of the Lord. Now, real quick, what does fear of the Lord mean? Uh, It doesn't mean to be afraid of the Lord in the sense of of terror or being scared of God. It's not that. It means to live in sort of reverential awe of God. It's for God to be seen for who he is. It's to see God as ultimate in your life, as ultimate in the world. And Paul says he aims to persuade others to live in reverential awe of God as well. And then he says, and what we are is known to God. And the we here is him and his travel companions. He's like, hey, I live in reverential awe of God. I'm persuading others to do the same. And then he says, God knows what I'm about. God knows that I'm about this. And he says, I hope that you recognize it too. And then verse 12, he goes on. We can go to verse 12. There's going to be a lot of that today. Brace yourself. Sorry for whoever's doing slides. Uh, Okay. And he's like, hey, I'm not trying to sell you on this. I'm not trying to sell myself to you on this. I just want you all to see what I'm about. So that when these false teachers show up, you recognize that they just care about outward appearance. They just care about how they look. And they don't see that, that for a true Christian leader, it's really about what's going on in the heart. He's saying, is their aim in life ultimately towards God's glory or their own? And then he presses on, verses 13 to 15. He says, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Okay, so if you can go back to verse 13 for me. 
Okay, so Paul says, listen, if, if we seem a bit eccentric to you, if we seem kind of out of our minds, he's saying, listen, it's, it's because we're caught up in living fully for God, and we've had these powerful experiences of his grace. And then, end of verse 13, when we try to communicate that to you, we try to do that in our rational mind, in our right mind. Why are we trying to do all this? Verse 14, because the love of Christ controls us. He's saying that everything we do and say is dictated by the love of Christ. It compels us. It moves us. It's animating our entire lives. Why? End of verse 14. Because we have concluded that in Christ's death, he died for all people, and all people died in him. Now, what does that mean? In Christ's death, all died. He dies for all people. That, that seems easy enough. If you grew up in church, we get that. But that all people died in him, meaning that anyone who has ever lived, and anyone who will ever live, are somehow, what Paul's saying here, are somehow eternally connected to the cosmos-altering reality of Christ's death. That we all died with him somehow. Now, how does that work? Well, it seems to me what Paul's saying here is that our sin, our death, our separation with God, our enmity with God, was crucified on the cross with Christ that day. That that is now dead and gone. And so now, verse 15, those of us who live in light of this reality now no longer live for ourselves. But we now live our whole lives for Christ, for the one who died and rose for us. So Paul's whole point in these first five verses is that through Christ's death and resurrection, he, Paul, has been given the ultimate direction for his life. He no longer lives for himself, but he lives fully for Christ. But he's saying it's not just him. That's not just his direction in life. It's for any of us, for any of you who have put your faith in Christ, you're given this same direction in life, that we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for ourselves, 945. But we live for the one who, for our sake, died and was raised. That's it. It's a big claim. This is big. It's a big verse. It's a big claim that Paul's making here. This text is saying, if you trust, if you trust in what Christ has done for you, you no longer live for yourself, but for him. That is the direction of your life now. That is what you live for now. Not making money. Not being successful. Not raising a family. Not graduating. Not experiencing the world. Now, obviously, all those things I listed, none of them are bad. Uh, and in fact, for the most part, they're good. But here's the point. They cannot be ultimate. They cannot be the ultimate aim of your life. They are insufficient, woefully insufficient aims for someone's life. See, because here's it. We, we all know something. There's something we all know in 945. We all know that there is what's called a, a meaning crisis, a meaning crisis in our part of the world right now. Whole corners of the internet are dedicated to this. People are recognizing that, that behind all the, the dark irony, behind all the addiction, behind all the cynicism, behind all the despair that is so pervasive in our culture right now, and in particular in younger generations, behind all of that is a nihilism that says ultimately nothing really matters. Philosopher Young Chul Han puts it like this in his book, the burnout society. The modern loss of faith does not concern just God or the hereafter. It involves reality itself and makes human life radically fleeting. Life has never been as fleeting as it is today. Not just human life, but the world in general is becoming radically fleeting. Nothing promises duration or substance. This is why what Paul says to us today is good news. See, if your ultimate direction in life is aimed towards something in this world, money, success, comfort, family, experiences, whatever, if that's your ultimate aim in life, you will inevitably run into the fleeting nature of life. Because aiming your life towards something that is contingent, aiming your life towards something that is finite, meaning that it will fade, it cannot promise duration and substance for the long haul. But if you take our text seriously today, if you live in reverential awe of God, you see that in Christ you 
have died and risen to new life, that you are united to him, that the one who lives and reigns for eternity is united to you, and you live all of your life ultimately aimed towards him. That's a promise with duration and substance. And then what's amazing is, is if you pursue your, your whole life as lived for him who died and rose for you, you then find that all those other aims in life, they find their proper place in him. Because what happens is when you're in Christ, the way you see others and the way you see yourself is transformed. It's transformed. Look with me at our next few verses. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All right, so we'll click back to verse 16. Okay, so verse 16 says, now that we live fully for Christ, he says, we don't look at other people the same way we used to. He's saying we don't look at others the way the world does. That, that when we look at others, we, we don't look at others selfishly to see what we can get from them. We don't look at others enviously, uh, seeing in them what I want but cannot have. We don't look at others judgmentally, staring down our nose at them thinking we're better than them. No, we don't look at them that way anymore. The way we see others has changed. No, since Christ died for all people and all people died in him, I now look at others, Paul's saying, as those for whom Christ died. As people who God loves and cares for. It transforms how I see others. Now, that's a big change. Like, how, how do we get that view? How do I get this view of others? Verse 17. In Christ, I'm a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. New creation. Now, what, is it, what does that mean to be a new creation? Like, what actually is Paul saying? Like, what, you are a new creation in Christ. Like, what, what does that actually mean? What is this new creation business about? Well, new creation is, it's mostly about the entire narrative of Scripture and basically the past, present, and future of everything that has ever existed ever. So it's a really small concept, okay? Minor point. Uh, and so in order to get at it, just allow me, if you would, 945, a, a quick summary of all of reality in about 20 seconds, okay? So God creates everything good, right? And he creates humanity in his image, and he creates us to be in relationship with him, in a good relationship with the creative world, and in relationship with one another. And 2.7 seconds later, humanity rebels against God, and so sin and death enter into the world, causing a separation between us and him, us and the creative world, and us and each other. But all along, God promises that one day he will renew the world. He will renew his creation. There will be a new creation renewed from its fallen state. That sin, death, sadness, sickness, all the bad stuff, everything sad will come untrue. There will be no more. And we will live in a new creation in right relationship with God, right relationship with the world, and right relationship with each other. And so when Jesus, the Son of God, comes into the world, he goes to the cross and dies for the forgiveness of our sins. And then when he rises again from the dead, he inaugurates the launch of God's new creation right here in the midst of the old one. And he gives us this promise that one day he will return in power and renew all things once and for all. And so in 1 Corinthians, in light of his resurrection, Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of the new creation. That he's the beginning of the new creation. And so then what he's saying here is that if you are united to Christ, if you're in Christ, the first fruits of the new creation, if you're bound to his death and resurrection, our text says that in him, you also then are a new creation. In him, you then are part of this new creation that's happening in the midst of this old one. You are a new creature in him. The self that was once a slave to sin and death has been set free. It is no more. This means that any shame, any guilt, any brokenness from your past is wiped away in Christ. That you're made new in him. That you're a new creation in Christ. And so then, in light of this reality, the invitation is for you to be who you already are in Christ. You're already a new creation in him. The invitation then is for you to be who you already are. Now, how's, how's that work? Uh, I think about it like this. Uh, between my freshman and sophomore year of college, I applied to work at a camp. 
I won't say its name because I talk about it too much. And I applied to work at this camp. And the position I wanted, uh, they typically did not give to first-year applicants. Uh, so I wrote, the, like, the greatest application of all time. It was, it was like, I've saved several orphans from fires. Uh, I've cured most diseases. Like, it was just incredible. And I just gassed myself up on this application because I really wanted this position. And I knew that playing the guitar, being able to play the guitar, was something that would help me secure this position. And so on the application, when it asked, do you know how to play the guitar, I checked the box, yes. Here's the problem, 945. I did not know how to play the guitar. I knew how to play a G chord. It's not like a total lie, but kind of a lie. Uh, but that was it. Here's the worst part. I got the job. And all of a sudden, I was like, what do I do? And I was like, I was on the phone, and my boss said, she's like, hey, we're so excited to have you, and we're especially excited that you play guitar, because we have no one else that can play the guitar. You are the guitar player this summer. And my heart sank. So here's the reality. I was the guitar player that couldn't play guitar. So guess what I did the second semester of my freshman year of college? Taught myself the guitar, right? Locked myself in my dorm room and forced my hand into position. I had to become who I already was, right? The same thing is true of you, to become who you already are. On account of his resurrection, you are already a new creation in Christ. Now it's a matter of learning to live into that reality. And it's hard, and it's messy, and this side of eternity, we won't ever fully get there, and we don't do it in our own power. But we seek to do it. We seek to live into who we are in Christ. It's often been put this way, that the Christian life is a life lived between D-Day and VE Day, right? D-Day, the decisive battle in World War II, VE Day, when the, battle, when the war was actually over. That through Christ's death and resurrection, the decisive battle has been won. Victory is assured. You are a new creation in Christ. But we continue to battle against sin in our life in anticipation of the final victory. And you can rest assured that that final victory is yours because you've been reconciled to God. Look with me at our next few verses. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Right, so we go back to verse 18. So this text says, hey, you are a new creation in Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. Why? Because you figured it out and you cleaned up your act and you got religious? No. You're a new creation in Christ because you're super smart and you got a 36 on your ACTs and a 4.0 and you went to AP classes? No. Verse 18, you're, you're a new creation in Christ. Why? All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. When sin separated us from God, even when it was our fault, he didn't tell us to fix it. He did it all. He reconciled us to himself. See, you understand, this is what's so scandalous about the gospel. Because think about how the rest of life works. Like if you mess up in life, okay, you mess up at work, you mess up at school, you mess up in your family, you mess up in life at all, who's responsible to clean up the mess you made? You. Just so you, know, you are, okay, not enough of you are nodding with that. Uh, you have personal responsibility, okay. Uh, you are responsible for it. If you wrong someone, who needs to pursue reconciliation? If you're the one who offended someone else, who needs to pursue reconciliation? You do. It's scandalous. Scandalous. Y'all know about Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is a, a black man and a, a blues musician uh, who for over 30 years has spent time befriending members of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so much so that he has a collection of Klansmen robes in his house of men who have left the KKK because of his friendship with them. Now, it isn't his responsibility to do that, is it? He didn't wrong them. They wronged him. They hate him. And yet, he's taken it upon himself to befriend them, to reconcile to them. It's absolutely scandalous. And yet, this is what Paul is saying has happened between God and the world. 
that despite the world's and yours and my rebellion against our creator, despite the messes that we are so prone to make in our lives, God doesn't tell us to clean it up. He cleans it up for us. God doesn't demand that you do something in order to reconcile yourself to him. No, in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting your trespasses against you. Theologian Miroslav Volf puts it like this. The difference between justice and forgiveness. To be just is to condemn the fault, and because of the fault, to condemn the doer as well. To forgive is to condemn the fault, but to spare the doer. That's what the forgiving God does. Now, in order to reconcile us to himself, how does God condemn the fault but spare the doer? Well, that's what the last verse of our text tells us. Verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That on the cross, Jesus Christ, God's own son, takes on your fault, takes on your sin, becomes sin for you. That on the cross, your sin might be condemned, but you, the doer, are spared and in fact are given his righteousness. This is what Luther calls the happy exchange. Jesus takes your sin and gives you his righteousness that you might be reconciled to God. Let, let me close here. See, there's all sorts of ways to, to make sense of what happens in the gospel. There's all these different images we have, right? Like if you grew up in church, maybe like, you know, Pastor Gabe, message today feels pretty familiar, okay? I think I've heard it before. Yeah, we, we have all these different images for, for how we think of the gospel, right? So one of them uh, is, is an image of redemption, right? Where we say, hey, we're redeemed in Christ. That is, we're bought back. I'd call that an economic image. Uh, then another one, popular in Lutheran circles, we're justified. That's meant to be a courtroom image, that we're declared innocent on account of Christ. We're justified, courtroom. Uh, another one is that we're set free. That's liberation imagery. One is that we're saved, that's rescue imagery, on and on it could go. But this image that we look at today, this image of reconciliation, I think is particularly powerful. Because the image is, is not one of a courtroom, it's not one of liberation, it's not one of rescue, it's not one of economics, though all of those are good and true images. Re reconciliation is relational imagery. That God is a God of relationships. God is a relational God, and he was not content to let sin separate you from him. So at great cost to himself, he brought about your reconciliation. And so in him, you find the ultimate aim for your life. In him, you are a new creation. In him, you have an eternal relationship with an eternal God. May you walk in that truth today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the reconciliation you brought about through our Savior, Jesus. All this is from you. We've done nothing to earn it, nothing to deserve it, and yet your love for us is so great. You drew near to us through your son, Jesus, and brought us back into right relationship with you, that in you we might be new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. Oh, Lord, teach us to live in light of this reality this day and always. 